OK, so how many GPs do we have here today? A few, not quite as many as I thought, but OK. Well, anyway, I'll just, you know, perhaps you're some of you are prospective GPs, but uh, we'll just have a quick whiz through what the problems are. And I think the, the, um, the first thing I would say is think hard about going into general practice. I wouldn't wish to discourage anybody at all. But it is, um, it is a high-stress game. I uh, had quite a number of years in doing hospital specialities. I, most of the time I spent in anaesthetics and paediatrics. And <clears throat> that was... Um, that is stressful, but it's a kind of exhilarating, adrenaline-based stress. And then when you get to general practice, it's very different. It's people stress, you know, multiple demands being made and often for things that don't seem very medical, along with partnership difficulties and management, all of those things. And then as a backdrop to that, you've got the, um, uh, the other problems. You've got all the, you know, the fear of litigation and uh, we've got, we're trying to do this uh, at the same time as obeying the teachings of the church and of course I mean that's a caricature nobody's wagging a finger at us in the church it's uh, we, we're trying to um, to love Jesus Christ to bring his his teachings to bear but we do have those two stresses going on and um, the other thing to um, bear in mind is that um, sorry what well, to say first of all as we saw this morning with St Thomas More you know our natural business lies in escaping so we don't want to go into general practice inviting problems and have a good think about whether you want in, to go into an area where there may be um, a number of problems anyway. The, the things that um, will always crop up are these. And uh, as you'll notice, these are all to do with uh, uh, reproductive um, aspects of humanity, if you like. I won't call it reproductive medicine necessarily. Um, and these things will come up time and time again. In particular, contraception will come up. And there are an increasing number of problems that arise now, which I didn't dream about. When I was a medical student 40 years ago, uh, I didn't dream that some of the things around today would ever happen. We thought that, you know, we thought all our problems would result, revolve around uh, contraception and abortion. So have a think whether it's really what you want to do. Um, and the other thing I would say is to, to, um, to be prepared because the, the things, the, the, the ethical dilemmas will arise at the, at the times we least expect them or at the, least, at the times we least want them to happen. So it won't be when we're feeling 100% and uh, you know, God is in his heaven. It will be on those days when there are people off sick and, and you're not feeling good and all those things. And I just draw this comparison with flying. You can't really compare medicine with flying because uh, medicine is... Um, I mean, flying is pure physics, but um, medicine is more unpredictable in a way. But if we, if, as pilots, we'd have to go to a simulator every six months and the same emergencies would be thrown at us time and time again. And then pilots have what are called um, memory items where they can't refer to checklists, they just have to kick in and do the necessary things um, very, very quickly. Um, and this is a situation where a plane has caught fire just when it's about to take off, which is very dangerous. But a friend of mine who is an airline pilot tells me this may very well be survivable on one condition, is that you follow the protocols. So the reason I'm telling you this is because although we can't be as prepared as in a game like flying, we know the things that will um, crop up commonly and we have to have a pretty good idea in our heads of what we're going to say, how we're going to react in those situations. Because if not, then we will we'll get flustered, we'll say the wrong things, we'll say things that could be interpreted as um, distressing or offensive and that's when the complaints will come in. So I would recommend that you have a, you know, that you sit down, perhaps sit down with your friends and colleagues and rehearse what you would say, you know, suppose no appeal request comes in, what would you do? Um, and really get it fixed in your mind. So we haven't got time to go through every single one of those. I'll just whiz through some of them then. The first is um, abortion is not really a problem. Um, obviously, no, it's a dreadful problem. When you look at the numbers, those are from 2021. And the world health figures are something like 55 million, I think. So it's the, you know, the most awful scourge that we've ever faced uh, in, in, uh, in history. Um, these days, with the... Um, the home abortion service increasingly 
uh, uh, people don't come to GP so much for abortions and we find ourselves dealing less with it. Um, in one sense, that's a help because it, it makes our jobs easier, perhaps, but at the same time, we don't have an opportunity to counsel women and, and offer them an alternative to that. Um, and also these days, you know, even very pro-abortion people uh, some, oft, often uh, perceive that abortion is some kind of a moral problem. Also, we're protected by legislation. We were told in the GMC guidelines this morning we have to follow the relevant legislation, and in this case, it's protective. Um, so how would you actually proceed with this? What I, what I always say is that if somebody comes to a doctor, we're not running supermarkets. We're running, you know, we're giving a medical opinion, and medicine is very much a profession of opinion. So we have to provide a medical opinion. And, you know, as we learn ad nauseum at medical school, we have to go through the same basic protocol every time. And um, with the thing that can protect us, we were allowed to opt out of abortion anyway, but um, the, the fact remains today, even though there are so many abortions, that strictly speaking, they're mostly illegal. Um, and it's just that the, the, the criteria are so loosely worded or so loosely interpreted that we have virtual abortion on demand. But if we're going to be conscientious, if, we, if somebody comes to us requesting a termination of pregnancy, then usually we would find that they don't fulfill the criteria. Or to have one, so we can we can approach it in that way first of all, and just simply say courteously that you know, in accordance with this legislation which I'm bound to adhere to, um, you, you you know you, you don't have the grounds for an abortion, but of course you are um, you're welcome to a second opinion. So I try to adopt an open door policy uh, and invite them to come back if they wish to to discuss things whenever they would like uh, with um, relatives, husbands parents and so on, the reality is that most of them want to come in and just have an off-the-shelf abortion and you don't see them again. But some, some are dissuaded sometimes. Um, and then it's all down to getting back to cooperation. It, we have to explain their entitlement to a second opinion um, with a, another doctor, uh, which they're entitled to in law. Okay, so everybody's entitled to a second opinion. But if we refer them directly, as we saw in the um, uh, consideration of uh, uh, cooperation and evil this morning, if we refer somebody directly down the corridor to Dr. Smith, who will do it for them, then that's, that's too proximate. That cooperation is too proximate. By informing them of their rights to a second opinion and how appointments are made for a second opinion at a particular surgery, then that, you know, at worst, could be considered a form of... Um, um, material indirect remote cooperation. Um, contraception is, um, <clears throat> sometimes this is difficult for us. You know, I talked to the beginning, there may be small crosses for us to bear. And uh, one of them may be the humiliation that we feel when we are um, supporting a, a notion which is not accepted by most of the world. So, uh, um, so, Prior to 1968, when Humanae Vitae was published, the church had always had that teaching anyway. It wasn't a new thing. It's just that when the pill came along, it seemed that possibly there was another angle here. And because it wasn't a barrier method, perhaps it would be morally acceptable. Um, but St Paul VI, after a long consultation, stood his ground. And we probably look, people, look like people who you know, crawled out from under a rock because we don't believe in, this, uh, in, 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 in contraception these days. And whereas it would have been considered um, a moral um, uh, misdemeanor at one, times, uh, one time, it's you know, probably considered to be a moral good by many people today um, and you know, irresponsible not to use contraception. So um, the things that are at stake are, first of all, the most important thing at stake is that for us as Catholics, contraception is intrinsically evil. Um, that's, 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 that's what we're trying to defend here. That's what we're trying to promote. And that's why we don't involve ourselves in it. There has always been the question of whether there is some early embryo loss with um, 
uh, with the pill of various types of pills. I won't step into that area. But in any case, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because we didn't ought to be using these, these uh, medicines anyway. Um, and remember also that you know, part of our defense can be that we, uh, we give medicines to correct physiology. We give medicines to make people better, to make them whole again. And this is really you know, the, uh, an example of, of using medicines to disrupt the, uh, the, the, um, the beauty and the harmony of the way that we're made. Um, but again, it's, you know, how do we um, uh, proceed? Well, we talked about letting patients know in advance, so a notice on the reception desk. Receptionists can be very helpful in filtering out the, you know, those of uh, patients of childbearing age who might be coming for contraception. Um, and uh, inevitably, some will slip through. So what do we do then? Well, once again, you know, it's a medical problem. I'm, I'm only trained as a doctor. That's all I can do is give a medical opinion. And uh, <clears throat> it may, you know, if we're going to approach medicine responsibly, and Dermot said earlier that uh, being a Catholic is compatible with giving excellent care. Well, if we're going to give good holistic care, the first thing we need to do is establish whether this woman is actually eligible to go onto the pill. Uh, in terms of her general health, because you know, as we know, there are many contraindications. So, is she a smoker? Um, is there a, a family history of uh, thrombotic disease? Um, is there hypertension and those things? And you know, it may help her to understand that it's not very good for her by explaining that there are these contraindications. She may have a rethink about the idea of a pill. Um, but once again, we have to very carefully explain our conscientious objection, um, the entitlement to a second opinion, but without referring. Um, so, what have we got? So, right, so the next thing would be sterilization. That's probably pretty straightforward. Okay, um, infertility investigation and treatment. Um, the you know, once again, we're looking for medical solutions. So people may come along, they've, they've tried for a period and not conceived. And so, okay, we'll go to the doctor and we'll apply for IVF. Um, but uh, again, we have to give medical opinions. So, and the first thing to do, once again, if we're going to be good all round doctors, is we don't just pack them off to an infertility clinic. We have to find out those things that we can from a general medical point of view. So we can, from the history and uh, doing a few basic tests, we can find out, is there something else underlying that's leading to the infertility? And it, possibly we could correct that. I mean, if somebody was, somebody was, for example, severely hypothyroid, perhaps if we corrected that, fertility would uh, restore itself anyway. Um, but um, the question is, how far can we go with um, further specific investigations that are relevant to uh, fertility itself? So, with the female, what sort of things would we do? Um, well, we could arrange hormone assays and scans, and um, if we refer them to a clinic, then, you know, visualizing the fallopian tubes. There's not a moral problem with those things at all, even if it's just, you know, it may be a single person who has discovered they're infertile and wants these investigations. We don't do anything immoral by investigating why that person is infertile. Um, uh, so, uh, we'll come to treatment in a second, but, and then for the male, well, it's a bit more challenging, and I think it's one of these cases where we just have to, we have to suffer the, um, a certain amount of humiliation and embarrassment, probably, because um, the, there are ethical and unethical ways of obtaining a semen sample, which is the essential investigation. And uh, in terms of ethical methods, um, there is there is a post-coital test, which I don't think we'd see very much now. Okay, but you know, years ago when I when I was a junior, uh, the idea was that a couple would have intercourse in the normal way and then attend a clinic, and then uh, a, a sample of uh, cervical uh, fluid would be taken, and you could analyse both the semen and the cervical mucus at the same time. Okay, so that would be okay if people were willing to do it. The other method is by the use of a perforated condom, and I put question mark there because it's one of those things which um, ethicists um, do um, uh, disagree about. So the idea is that a couple would have intercourse in the normal way using a condom that was perforated, and then a very small amount of uh, semen would leak through, and then in a 
probably quite a legalistic way. We could call that a valid marital act. Um, not all ethicists agree on that. And then what is retained in the, in the condom is sent to the lab. Um, and I understand from Eileen that it depends, you know, your, your local lab may accept that method or they may not. Um, certainly where I was working, they weren't accepting that. And I, I um, discreetly told a patient to, to use that method, but just to empty the semen into the tube. And, and, and of course, you put the condom in the tube and, and, and a circular came round from the lab. And, uh, and, and so, so I was rumbled anyway. So, but, um, and then, of course, the, uh, the unethical method is uh, by just devising the uh, masturbation. And, uh, you know, people would find it very hard in a society which is so um, oriented to recreational sex Nobody can really understand why we would still have an objection to this, but this is based on the teachings of the you know, scripture of, uh, of Revelation. Um, so it, it may be very difficult to, uh, to communicate this to people. Um, and then what about treatment? Um, well, um, can we refer, can we in conscience, can we refer for further investigation? Well, investigations themselves, I mean, there's the, the question mark over the semen sample, but the, 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 uh, the female investigations, um, I don't think there are any particular moral problems there. Um, the difficulty is when it comes to further treatment and the things that um, uh, need to be avoided are anything which takes con conception outside of the marriage bed, outside of the context of the marriage itself. Um, and anything which produces spare embryos, which will later be discarded or frozen, uh, creating an even, an even further problem. So can we refer or not? Well, my approach to this was that I would, if, if I did refer anybody, which, which is actually rare, but if I did, I would explain to them that um, I, you know, I have this conscientious objection to the treatments which you may be recommended. I'm happy to refer you for the investigation part of this process, um, but there isn't any point in coming back to me afterwards for, for further prescriptions or, uh, or, or whatever. Um, so that was my approach to that. And, um, uh, and then the, the other thing that can be a problem is um, these days is uh, treatment for sexual dysfunction. So we're talking about, you know, effectively erectile dysfunction. And it's a very good thing. These treatments haven't been around for that long. Um, and um, th th if we can restore normal, fu normal functioning in a marriage, then it's a very good thing for us to do because remember that it's, you know, the fact that uh, couples are able to have sex is what makes it a marriage. It's very fundamental to the marriage. Um, and uh, in fact, in the church, with, you know, it's the only church, I think, that dares to call sex a holy um, activity. And... Uh, but again, it is circumstantial. So it's the, you know, the circumstances, thinking back to the, uh, the sources of morality, if sex is taken outside of marriage, those circumstances are what render it uh, immoral. It's something which is good in itself, is rendered immoral by the circumstances. So can we treat this? Um, well, really, you know, the drug itself is, uh, is, is morally neutral. Um, and it wasn't originally developed for, um, uh, for this purpose. Um, and um, how, but if somebody comes to me with a request for this, and how would I proceed? Well, once again, we want to be good doctors. So what's actually causing that? Is it just, you know, is, is it just a very simple, um, is it a straightforward question of providing Viagra? Or is there something else going on? And maybe we can rule out these other things and maybe that will return normal erectile function. And, that, and our conscience shouldn't bother us there at all because we've just really restored integrity. And what that person chooses to do with it is not our business. You know, we don't, as we said earlier, we don't have any mandate to, to police people's private lives. So we shouldn't be worried about that. Um, in terms of giving the treatment itself, then... Um, I'll tell you what I used to do, and there's a bit of a story to this. But um, 
if somebody came to me who uh, we established had needed treatment, then my practice was to give it to people who were married, but not to people who were unmarried. Um, and how did I know if somebody was married or not? Well, ultimately, I didn't know, because somebody could have been married three times. So I just used to take it on good faith that they were, if they were in a marriage of some sort, I would accept that as valid because I didn't have the competence to set up a marriage tribunal during a 10-minute appointment. Um, so so that, that was my approach. Um, and then, um, yeah, so... And obviously you have to sensitively explain your conscience, very sensitively explain your conscientious objection here because this was, I think, this was the, the area that most frequently... Uh, led to slamming doors and uh, uh, dissatisfaction with my service. Um, and then, of course, they, people do have a right to a second opinion, as with everything else. Now, you don't realise it, but you've just been subjected to a test of who's actually awake today. <laughs> if you think back to, to this morning's guidelines, General Medical Council Guidelines, can anybody see? Anybody see what I've done wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, I was. So, I got to a point. So, I'm, by giving this to to married but not to unmarried, I I became aware, or somebody pointed out to me, I think, that I was discriminating. And so, I wrote to the GMC and explained the situation, and asked if it would be uh, acceptable for me to opt out of giving those treatments at all. And they agreed. So that was, and, and we are allowed to do that. In, a, in line with the guidelines, we're allowed to opt out of, of uh, providing things that we, we don't feel to be in the patient's best interest. Of course, our notion of best interest would be different to the secular world in this situation. Um, right, OK. Um, yeah, so there's, that's, 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 that's the guideline. Um, right. Um, and then gender reassignment. Do we refer for that or not? Um, I, I didn't actually encounter this very much, but a couple of times I did refer somebody to a gender reassignment clinic. And my thinking there was that if, 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 if somebody is um, seeking gender reassignment, then the, the first stage of it is a, is a psychological assessment. And that assessment, I don't think, I wasn't, couldn't find anywhere that would do a freestanding assessment for for somebody with gender dysphoria before moving on to possibly to treatment. So once again, I, if I refer them, I used to say to them that I, you know, I cannot, um, if you'd go ahead with this treatment, um, then I can't cooperate with that, but I'm happy to refer you to the psychological assessment. Um, but in the guidelines that we saw this morning, we are actually allowed not to, um, uh, to refer. We can opt out of that altogether. Now, uh, so that's you know, so that's a potted version of what I would have been saying.